All right, y'all. So we've been talking about these mean Christians. Have, have, have y'all run into any mean said, Christians uh -oh. since I've been teaching? Said, uh -oh. You ain't hopefully you haven't, you haven't run into them in the right direction, have you? You haven't run into them in, in, in our parking lot. Help me hope you haven't run into in children's church. Surely not the ushers, not the greeters. No, praise the Lord. All right. Okay, so we've been talking about a uh, mean Christian based upon Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, where it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgetting, forgiving, Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Thank you. So all that, you put bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking together, put some malice on top of that, mm. you got somebody very mean. Mm. Amen? Amen? And say, so it says we need to put all that away from us. Put it away. Somebody say, put, put it away. Put it away. Yeah. Put it away. Don't take that out. In other words, it's gonna, it'll try to rise up in you. It'll try to uh, grab hold of you, but put it away, keep it down. And you know, Paul says that, that we, should, we should crucify mm. our flesh daily. I keep under my body. And uh, we, we, have to, we have to take the born again spirit and crucify daily keep under that unregenerated man, that carnal nature, that flesh nature, if we're not going to be mean Christians. So we, we saw one of the meanest incidents of scripture in John 8, where we have the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. It was mean just to women. It was mean more specifically to this woman, the fact that supposedly she's in adultery, but they grab her and they, they bring her out the act, act of adultery and, and they, they, we don't know what she had on or if she had anything on, bring her into the temple. They're so mean, they're not even thinking about honoring God or disrespecting the temple. They just want to they just want to get at this woman, bring her before Jesus, and then hopefully in Jesus trying to trying to be mean to Jesus to catch him in something, uh, to say something that 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 they could accuse him. And then they were already they were prepared to stone her. Just mean. And Jesus to to cause them not to be mean, cause them to reflect on themselves. Let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone. That is John 8 and 7. So whenever you think about being mean to somebody or acting out in your flesh, think about how you would want to be treated. And think about did you ever do anything that, if some, if, that you could deserve or somebody could be mean towards you. But thank God that God commended his love towards us, the scripture says, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Amen? So when we looked at these mean Christians, we started looking at why there are such things as mean Christians, which should not be. We said, number one, because of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, people are almost forgetting that they're cleansed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, mm -hmm. sanctified by the blood, and become self-righteousness. And the Bible says all of our righteousness, according to Isaiah 64 and 6, is as filthy rags. You, you could not clean yourself up. Paul says anybody who's self-righteous is because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. That's Romans 10 and 3. He said because of being ignorant of God's righteousness, they seek to establish their own righteousness. If you have a revelation of God's righteousness, you realize you can't establish your own righteousness. Amen. Amen. And then number two, we said that pride. Pride makes you think of yourself more highly than you ought to think which causes you to be insensitive to other people, mean to other people. Pride makes you think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, and in the middle of pride, P-R-I-D-E, -E, in the middle of pride is I, 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 which was the original sin of Satan himself. He said, I will ascend to the Most High. I will, I will, I will be like God. I will also be worshipped. Okay, and so I makes you think about yourself more than you think about other people. So pride's in your heart, but then it's going to cause you to think wrong, and as a result of thinking wrong, you're going to behave wrong. Amen? Amen. Number three, we said that now what caused people to be mean is arrogance. Arrogance caused you to have a proud look and look down on other people, and that's manifested by you looking down on other people and treating people in a mean way. It shows up in your behavior, how you treat people. And we saw that Peter, 
initially was arrogant, thinking that the Jews are better than the, than the Gentiles, and, and he referred even, he was he, he even referring to Gentile people who were not uh, descendants of Abraham as unclean. And God said, don't call anything that I have made or I have cleansed unclean. Mm. And so God dealt with him about that. And even though he dealt with him about that, we, in Acts 10, and he is amazed, and he comes back in Acts 11, tells the rest of the apostles and the church, I was shocked, but I saw God, the Holy Ghost, fall on them just like he fell on us on the day of Pentecost. They started speaking in tongues just like we did. There is a God. Mm -hmm. And surely, yes, they're saved just like us. And so even though he knew that, by the time uh, in Galatians 2, but yet even though he knew that, we see him still acting in a mean, prejudiced way. Because in Genesis and in Galatians 2, uh, Paul writes, and Paul tells it all. He could have avoided telling this, but he told it. He said, I'm going to tell it. I'm going to write it down and let it be in the scriptures so everybody can know 2,000 years from now that you had an issue, that you were prejudiced. Mm -hmm. And so when, when the other Jews were weren't around, he sat down and he ate with the common people, with the Gentiles. But then when other Jews came, he separated himself and started only eating with the, with the Gentiles and, and about the Jews. And uh, Paul rebuked him about that because he said he was to be blamed. Sometimes you got to confront other Christians for being mean. Wow. Sometimes you may need to stop. You know, the, you, the, the, was, was, that, was that really necessary? Mm -hmm. Did you have to treat them like that? Mm -hmm. Did, did it require all of that? You know, you were doing the most there. Mm. You know, what, what you just did there, that, 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 wasn't, wasn't, nice. that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what you said there, that, that, that wasn't kind. And sometimes we need to hold each other accountable for walking in love and not being in me, not, not being mean. And so, number four, we're going to spend time talking about tonight. The reason why there's such a thing, though it should not be such a thing, as mean Christians because of a fruit deficiency. Fruit deficiency. Meaning you, have, you either don't have the fruit or you got undeveloped fruit. And I think by the end of me teaching at noon today, I said you got rotten fruit. <laughs> Some people's fruit is just rotten. Oh, my goodness. Okay? So Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Go ahead, since you're just sitting here. I don't just want to sit here. I want people to know you can read, not just sit here and be a pretty uh, face. Uh, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So we know of nine gifts of the Spirit, mm -hmm. according to Romans 12. But also here in Galatians 5, we know nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That, that, that makes it real plain from the New King James Version. And he said, against such there is no law. In other words, nobody is going to restrict you because you got too much joy. There's no laws against loving somebody too much. There's no laws in being too peaceful. There's no laws against being too patient or long-suffering. He said, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. And when you get saved, the fruit of the Spirit, watch this, is the per should be the personality of the Christian. Right. The fruit of the Spirit should be our personality traits. So if you, if you see that you are not operating in love, you have no joy, you have no peace, you're not long-suffering, you're not kind, you know, you, you don't demonstrate any goodness or faithfulness mm. or gentleness or temperance, which is self-control, then you realize, I, I got a problem. Either I got undeveloped fruit or my fruit is rotten, and I'm going to go, go even further. You, you'll see what I'm talking about. You need to question whether you're really even saved or not. We came, I came across a scripture last night, um, and I saw it through a, through a I saw it on um, C.C. Wanin's Instagram mm -hmm. timeline. And the scripture, I believe, was, I want to say 1 Corinthians 10, 14. The Lord help me to re have remembered that correctly. If not, I'll find it. 1 First, First Corinthians 
It was John Bevere teaching at her and her husband's church. I think it's first Corinthians 10, 14. Uh, that ain't it. Let me see. Uh, no, not knowledge of God. Let me look up knowledge of God. It's in Corinthians here. But I want you all to see this. Uh, let me see knowledge of God. First Corinthians. Mm, hold on here. Knowledge of him, knowledge of God, knowledge of God. Ah, uh, boy, okay. Bring it back to me, Lord, here. Um, hold on. First, first Corinthians 15.34, is this it? Awake to righteousness. And That's it. First Corinthians 15.34. I wasn't even close, right? Mm -hmm. Awake to righteousness and sin, not for some have wait, not. Wait, 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 wait. Read that again. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Thank you. <laughs> I said, answer. You said sin. Please don't read. We try. Yeah, yeah. Oh, rewind. For some have not the knowledge of God. Mm. Wow. I speak this to your shame. Now listen to that from the from the from the New International Version. Come back to your senses, as you are. Stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But this one is even plainer. The New Living Translation. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. Mm. Wait a minute. Mm. This, is, this is Paul writing to the church. Wow. He says, some of y'all in the church are sinning and you don't know God at all. Wow. That's something. You don't know God at all. I've been saying this for the last couple of years, and sometimes I'm even hesitant to say it because I know it sounds like old time holiness, okay? But. Uh, but, you know, I, I've been saying in our private conversation, a lot of these folks think they say they ain't saved. A lot of people, we think yeah. saved, they ain't saved. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And because we got a lot of people who are, they come to church, and watch this. <laughs> we got believers who ain't saved. Well, what's the believer? In the, people who believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is the Savior of the world, but you ain't saved. What are you talking about? The Bible says even the devil believes in Jesus. Devil knows Jesus is the Lord of, uh, Lord of all. Satan believes and trembles. And I believe we got a lot of people in the church. They come to church. They're religious. They um, consent and assent to Christianity. But in terms of what is happening on the inside of them, they're not saved. Remember the scripture that says there's going to be many come and say, Lord, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. And what was he going to say? Depart me. Depart from me. I don't know you. I think the scripture says I never knew you. Mm. It's not even saying they backslid. Mm. It said there's going to be people say, wait, wait, what, but Lord, what, I did all this stuff in your name. I served. I, I worked in the parking lot. And I, he said, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. Now you're stirring something up. Oh, here. I know I am. But because if you were saved, there's going to be some fruit. And people got to church scared to even say stuff like this. Because everybody, you're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to, the Bible don't say we're not supposed to judge. The Bible says by your fruit, you know them. It said don't judge without evidence. But we are supposed to be fruit inspectors. If there's no fruit, then it ain't the tree I think it is. A, a few years ago, we went to, first time we went to Scottsdale, Arizona for a conference. We go there yearly for a conference. Made me go a couple months from now for a conference. But we went there. I had never seen this before. I grew up in Jersey City. You grew up in Newark. And even down here in South Carolina, we got cypress trees, cypress uh, pine trees and pine trees and oak trees. But when we went out there, we ride down the street and in front of peop in people's lawns, we saw, we saw orange trees. Mm -hmm. That's common. That's just common. Yeah. Now, y'all know, boy, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be near orange. Everybody have orange juice. 
But just, just, it's just regular. Just, just, oranges. everybody just have oranges, oranges and lemons, okay? And I had never been to Scottsdale, Arizona, never been to Phoenix before, but as soon as I saw that tree, I said, I didn't say, is that a watermelon tree? Is that a tomato tree? Is, are those grapes? I knew immediately what kind of tree it was because it had the fruit on it. Well, you judging that tree. No, I looked at the tree and I can see what kind of tree it was. Jesus said, we're going to know you by your fruit. And the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle, uh, gentleness, self-control. Now, some of, I mean, you ought to have some of this fruit. You ain't got at, none of it. At least one, right? I mean, I know you mean, but do you have any joy? <laughs> you don't see mean people, boy, they have no love. They ain't got no joy. They ain't no got no peace. peace. They're impatient. They're not kind. Nothing good about them. They won't be <laughs> faithful. They have oh. no gentleness about them. They have no self-control. Uh, I mean, my good, do you have any fruit? That's perplexing. Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? So how can you be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwell within you and no fruit? Did the Holy Ghost pick his bags up and go? <laughs> right, that's a whole nother thing too, honey. That's a whole, that's nother, a whole thing. nother thing. That's a whole nother thing because I ain't going to go too deep into that. Go ahead. Go because ahead. I know it's a new day. It's a new day. And everybody don't get filled the same. Mm. You didn't tarry. Nope. I tarry. Mm -hmm. I know I got filled. And I know I got filled. And you know you got the got, Holy Ghost fell on you. Fell on me, the way knocked he me did, over. The way he did me in down. 1 Corinthians, uh, the 10th chapter at Cornelius house. He I had fell. an encounter. He fell on her. And she didn't know what was happening. Everybody else didn't know what happened. I saw her down there laying, going in. I said, oh, I forgot knocked to tell down. you about that part. I, I was working on that. I didn't get a chance to tell you about this Holy Ghost you didn't, stuff. You didn't, you didn't I didn't move want fast her. enough. You didn't move fast enough. I didn't enough. want her. She didn't know nothing about it. And, and the reason why the, God had to fill her, because you know, I was trying, she was Catholic. I, I, was trying, I, was trying to be, I was trying to be gentle with this stuff. I'm trying to ease her into this new life, this, 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 this new Pentecostalism stuff. Uh, my and, uh, but some of these folks. So what you trying to say, Bishop? Some of these folk, they ain't get filled. They, they heard. They heard and they repeated. And they repeated. Say A, A, B, B, C. Concentration. Are you ready? No hesitation. On repeat. Kata. Kata. Bata. Bata. Kita. Kita. Ikobo. Ikobo. Some of these folks, y'all ain't, some of these Feel folks the ain't Holy filled. Ghost. Some of y'all ain't, some of these folks ain't filled. Uh, You've been in the church a long time. You done heard enough. Mm, You've been, you, you been around the church a long time. You speaking as you giving utterance. My goodness. Not as the Spirit is giving utterance. If you get filled with the Holy Ghost, it comes with some sign, with some fruit. Oh, Jesus. Somebody said, well, I shouldn't have came tonight. <laughs> So we're supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit. Look at Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. Now he's showing us, he said, you were once darkness. I'll give you several scriptures that you, about, so we've been, Colossians first chapter, you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear sons. You were, in, you were once in darkness, in trespasses and sins, but now, you know, we've been brought into the light. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, for you were once darkness. We once lived we weren't in the kingdom of God, That's, but now you are light in the Lord. Now look at this, walk as children of light. Mm. He said, live like who you are. Mm. Walk as children of the light. Then he starts talking about the fruit of the Spirit again. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. He said, now that we are children of the light, that should manifest in our behavior. Are y'all with me here? Now, just because you behave like a Christian, don't necessarily mean that you are a Christian. You can just be going through the motions, particularly in front of other people. But if you are really saved and have the fruit of the Spirit, it's going to come up out of you. And the way we treat people is a measure and indicator of our relationship with the Lord and the love of God in us. 
not just how we run around the church, not just how, how we serve in church, not even, and we all know I want you all to give, I need you to give, I want you to give generously, but you can be a big, good, generous giver and be mean and not display any fruit of the Spirit. So the way we treat people is a measure, an indicator of our relationship with the Lord and the love of God that's in us. Look at John 13, 35. Remind you of this. Jesus said, by this, he's talking about loving one another. By this, will, all will know you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. Let's flip that around. If you have love for one another, by this, all will know you are my disciples. Jesus didn't even say they're, they're going to know where his disciples based upon how often we come to church. By the fact that we listen to Christian music by the fact that we dress like a Christian, whatever that is now, okay? By the fact that we carry big Bibles. You know, Pastor Marsh and I, we, 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 we kind of joke among ourselves. Sometimes we see some of the old-time saints. When I say old-time, I don't mean they old because they can be young, but you can tell they old-time. We, we can see them. And, 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 and we, 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 we kind of, we, like we walk through the mall and see them when looking like they look, and we say, praise the Lord. They say, praise them. <laughs> It wasn't because we saw no love. We, they just looked like the old time saints. Okay? It didn't even say by that that they'll know we're disciples. They're going to know that we're disciples by the love we display to one another. And disciples here, it means followers of Jesus and people who act like Jesus and discipline ourselves according to his teachings. Okay? You know, every, uh, sometimes it come up my timeline on social media, something, something that, that um, uh, um, not Malcolm X, uh, not, um, Farrakhan, something that Farrakhan, and Farrakhan to this day will say, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us. One thing you know, if you listen to Farrakhan, that he was a disciple mm -hmm. Of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, whether we agree with anything he said, that's all another deal. But it's clear he remembers what he said and he repeats what he said. And we should demonstrate we are disciples. We are disciplined. Our, the word discipline, the root word that is disciple, we are people who discipline our lives based upon what Jesus taught. And the main thing he taught that they're going to know and distinguish us is that we have love for one another. Listen to that verse also from the New Living Translation, John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Flip that around so we get more revelation. You're going to prove to the world you are my disciples by your love for one another. That's how we prove to the world that we're really Jesus' disciples, by love for one another. And so as we're going through this series... I hope that we're questioning ourselves and evaluating ourselves and measuring ourselves and saying, do I demonstrate the love of God? And can I tell you, demonstrating the love of God has nothing to do with what other people do. I have been amazed, especially over these last couple of years, we've dealt with people and, and marriages and divorces and, 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 and the whole thing. I, I even said, I said to our, I said on a meeting the other night, I, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, you know, left to Jesus, nobody would get divorced. So we can't say divorce is Christian. Amen. I mean, I mean, Jesus, the scripture said, read why people got to get divorced because the hardness of hearts. That, that's in the scripture. But I said, I said, boy, I said, somebody ought to write a book about how Christians should get divorced. And what I mean by that, if you're a Christian, for if the marriage didn't work, that means you got to become the devil to each other. No, I'm serious about that. Act like people who never knew Jesus because you're mad at your spouse or your ex-spouse, the way you talk to each other and act towards each other and, and let all this venom come out. Even, even in that, I, I start saying, did these people ever, did they ever know Jesus? No, I'm serious about this. I'm real serious. Because just because you, you get mad as a Christian, that does not give you the right to act like the devil. Right. The test of Jesus in us is when we are mad. When we would 
Paul said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. But now mature Christian flipped that around. When I would do evil, good is present with me. I got a choice. The more mature I become and the more fruit that develops in my life, I choose the good over the evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have wanted to cuss people out. Yes, I've wanted to cut people, but I realized I don't. I, Did you I, say cut? I said cut. Cuss and cut. I have wanted to. But you didn't. But I didn't for the spiritual reason that I'm a Christian. For the natural reason, I don't think I could do prison. I, I, no, I couldn't, I, couldn't do, I couldn't do time. They're going to have to put a suicide watch over me. <laughs> Stop I it. couldn't do it. No, sir. Oh, my goodness. I told y'all. <laughs> I, can't, I can't demonstrate what I used to do no. three years ago. I'll no. be standing against the wall all the time. I'll be, I'll be sleeping against the walls, just standing like that. I couldn't do prison. Mm. No, sir. No, I, I, I couldn't make it. I mean, I, I, well, I, I, get, I, get, I, get, I get triggered when I read about Peter going to prison and Paul being in prison. Oh, Jesus. Okay. But seriously, I mean, I have feelings. We got feelings just like everybody else. Years ago, years ago, I, I, uh, I yelled at a staff member. I mean, I yelled at the top of my voice. Uh, and I um, only had one then. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, don't you ever raise your voice and talk to anybody like that. The, the Lord really, really rebuked me. And what they had done, they had done something that was, but what, I can't remember the details of what it did, but at the time I felt it was warranted. But the Lord said, no, you, you can't act like that. Our response, not just our actions, but our reactions is also an indication of whether we're really Jesus' disciples. Mm. And he demonstrates that on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them. What? Yeah. Forgive them. Yeah. On the cross. Y'all know that was us. What you do to me is already, already done, done to you. you. <laughs> Lord, put them on the cross, and they ain't going to be raised. <laughs> and they ain't going to die in no three hours. Let them be on here for two days. <laughs> no, Father, forgive them. Mm. His reaction demonstrates the love that we have to have. First John 3.17. You can jump in anytime you want to, honey. Again, talking about this love as a measurement for whether we are really Jesus' disciples. First John 3.17. For whoever has this world's goods. Now he's talking about to those of us who are blessed. And y'all know all that is relative. Right. One of my daughter-in-law says third world problems. She was first, at first. F- first, first, first world problems. She had the other day and I got frustrated. Because we, uh, we have this ice maker that Pastor Marsha thinks that pulling it out is going to make more ice come in there. So she pulls it out from the cabinet. Are we going to do this tonight? Anyway, and I push it back. <laughs> she pulls it out. I, push it. I don't even do, talk about it. You don't need to talk about she it. She pulls it out. I push How it back. How dwells the love she of pulls God it out, in you? I push it back. She pulls it out. I and think so you made a mean my Christian right now. <laughs> my daughter-in-law was in the kitchen. I said, she always... Pulling this, and she said, first world problems. Uh Y'all understand the first world is industrialized nations, third Mm -hmm. world is African nations, Haiti, and some stuff we complain about, we get all, it's first world problems. First world problems. Things that people in the third world and these these depraved countries can't can't wrap their brain that we would be complaining about. We saw this morning uh, on the news, Mm. kids starving to death in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a child, a child that's like a year or two, mm-hmm. uh, like a year mm-hmm. old, mm-hmm. that's something like that. That was six pounds. Yeah, yeah, they're starving. Look like yeah. a skeleton. Children laying there and spiders crawling on their face, and they're di- and they're dying of 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 uh, of starvation. Yeah. And people on the streets, and there's, there's one place they were just baking bread. Remember what we will look like just. Pita pizza, mm-hmm. look like pita bread, or look like little pizzas to us without anything on it. And then people just lined it up, adult, and they were just giving them, giving them this. And so the Bible tells us, whoever has this world's goods, 
And most of us, by our third world standards in this room, we got the goods. Yep. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up, the King James says, his bowels of compassion, the new King James shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in you? So the script is saying that there are times when we will see a need and God will start talking to you. And God will tell you to get involved. That is another indication that we are Christians, that we're his disciples, that we get involved in needs of other people, that we allow God to talk to us about other people's needs. So when we became Christians, when we got saved, when we got born again, whichever terminology you want to use, the love of God was supposed to come in our hearts. And the reason why I say supposed to, because the scriptures that ask, that ask if it's there, that scripture asks if it's there. It says, if you can just never help anybody, you're never concerned by anybody's need, you can see people suffering, it means nothing to you. He said, how does the love of God abide in you? He said, is the love of God really in you? And the first fruit is what? Love. Yeah. As a matter of fact, some people, the way they teach that, the fruit of, and the fruit of the spirit is love, and then they do colon that all those other things that are listed are a byproduct of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, meekness, etc. It's a byproduct of love. So when we, became, when we got saved, the love of God was supposed to come in our hearts. Romans 5 and 5. Romans 5 and 5 says, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit mm. who was given to us. So all the more now, you say you are filled with the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues. The love of God has been poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So with the Holy Spirit also comes love. It ought, it ought, to, it ought to increase the fruit. Right. It's, it's been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So when we get saved, all the more when we receive the Holy Spirit, and love is not merely what you feel. Love is demonstrated. Mm, right. Love right. is the scripture that, that often is used in the New Testament, particularly in King James Version. It says Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion, by definition, simply means love in action. Mm. Love in action. Compassion is love in action. Not feeling, not, not just this emotional stuff. Love can be seen. Love is seen by how we treat people, how we respond to people. Love is seen by the tone of our voice. Mm. Yeah. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, you know, and with the evidence of speaking in tongues, receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost sh uh, shed the love of God in our heart. And, and, and the truth, and really, you know, and you know, we can debate about whether or not this is just re referring even in one of the Holy Spirit, because when we get saved, Mm. We're baptized into the body by, right. the, Holy by the Holy Spirit. So even people don't speak in tongues. Right. Okay. Because you do have some Christians who aren't filled. Right. Who, who operate are, who, in a whole nother level, level of, of love, love than those who speak in tongues. We these mean, nasty tongue talkers. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's, a, there's, there's something missing here. You know, but Jude 20 talks about that you build yourself mm. up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, and what keeping else? yourself in the love of God. So there's things that go on. So if we're really regularly praying in the Holy Spirit, right. we ought to be getting more baptized in the right. love of God. Right. The love of God should be increasing us more. More, and it will pull wow. you back from this place of acting out of character as a Christian. So, you know, you're dealing with an individual, you're going through something, you're on your job, something happens, you know, you feel like your fruit is being squeezed, is about to be some plucked. Some people will squeeze your fruit. They will. You find a place to go because Jude 20 says you can keep yourself in the love of God by praying in the Holy mm, Ghost. That's good. So you take that time. I, gotta, you know, I need to take a yeah, break. Yeah. I need to go for a walk. I want to say sometimes you got to speak in tongues Come on. to keep from speaking out of tongues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so sometimes, you know, as married couples, yeah. you need to walk through the house sometime. You're like, so, sometime when you're going through the house praying the Holy Ghost, it's because you want to speak out of tongue to me? No, no, sir. Oh, nah, just checking, nah, just checking. Nah, I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost. But, 
but means that canceled out what we just said. <laughs> you know, so you know, so we have to really be deliberate, you know, and I think more so now than ever because I mean people are just wound up tight, you know, and they they on the they on the edge. And so we can't be on the edge like them because we have a hope. I don't see none of y'all fighting on the plane. I hope just, not. I mean, I saw just, just, just going at it. Just, yeah. woo, but yeah. on, people on planes today, just like, <laughs> like WWE. Cussing them out. But no, we have the love of God. And so, I, so regular fellowship with the Holy Spirit can help us if we're challenged in this area. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Paul says that the love of God, which should, dem- which should cause us to not be mean mm-hmm. and demonstrate kindness and compassion and long-suffering. By the way, that long-suffering, I, I used to find it is this way. The Holy Spirit helps us to have a long fuse. Say it by faith. Say, I have a long fuse. You all know some people just read the Bible. Because one of the things 1 Corinthians says, the love of God is not touchy. You just touch, boom. Yeah. Can't say anything. Okay. You know, just, they go from zero to 100 like that. You know, I'm, you're like, what, what's wrong? What, what happened? I just asked you a question. Okay. Uh, the love of God and the fruit of the Holy Spirit with long suffering because you'd have a long fuse. If you have a long fuse, you're able to put that thing out and quench it before you explode. Everybody say, come on, raise your hand and say, Lord, Lord help me, help me. To have a long fuse. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. But concerning brotherly love, Paul says, you have no need that I should write to you. Paul said, I can't even believe I got to write to you about love. Wow. Because that's supposed to be the nature of the Christian, but I'm even giving you instruction about this. Because you really have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves without me writing a letter, mm. without me getting the inspiration by the Spirit of God to write. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another. God teaches us to love each other without a lesson, it's supposed to be, without instruction. He said, and indeed you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. And, and so in this case, he's really commending them. He said, I really should have to, he said, but here, I want you to take it to another level. But we urge you, brethren, that you what? Increase more and more. So that tells us that, that the fruit of the Spirit, the love fruit, can increase. I want you to go demonstrate even more love than you're used to. You know, years, and, and my wife and my family's a testament uh, to this. Years ago, you know, I was a young pastor, I was still, especially when I was still handling those claims. I was stressed. I was stressed. I was aggravated, financial issues, whatever. And, uh, and I would come home, and, and my kids were almost, you know, instead of running to me like daddy's home, they started running away like the, y'all, y'all can't relate to this, but like the, like the roaches when you cut on the lights. Y'all don't know nothing about that. If you do, don't, don't act like you know. Okay? But some of us, we came up with that way. You come, you know, uh, in, in the projects, you'd have roaches, and you'd cut the lights on, and just go scattering. Okay? And, um, and so I would come home, get, get, get in this room. How many times did I tell you about these toys? Put these sneakers. Didn't I tell you? That's how I walk, walk in the house. What kind of atmosphere does that set in the home? Okay? Marcy asked me something. Well, what, what, what you think? <laughs> Are you upset? Do I, do you, do, what makes you think I'm upset? Now, I know y'all can't relate to any of this. And one time I came home, I was, uh, and the kids were just being kids. That's all they're doing. The kids just being kids. When you got little kids, they're going to be kids. Kids going to play. Kids going to make noise. Especially if you have four. And, and, and then, 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 then you know how you get on one and the rest of them start laughing? <laughs> then they all, I don't, I don't want to see anybody laugh ever again in this house. I'm going to give you something to laugh about. <laughs> and then it, gets, then it goes to another level. One time came home, I came over, but I, 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 I said, I want peace. I want peace in this house. 
crazy, man. Peace in this house. That was crazy. And the Lord said to me, I'll never forget, the, the, the same Lord, I mean, there's times when, you know, I got a rhema word from the Lord. That's why I can go back and tell these stories. But I know very specifically when the Lord spoke that to me. Just like I know when he told me this is my wife. Just like I know when he told me to come to South Carolina. South Carolina. Just like I know when I was sitting down in the, praying in the Adams Mark Hotel, which is now the Marriott Hotel, they told me to start right direction here. The Lord spoke to me that day and said, you are the one disturbing the peace. And the Lord said to me, if you get a hold of yourself, you will have peace in your house. And I made a commitment that I'm going to start bringing peace in this house. Rather than just try to demand peace, I'm going to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. Make me an instrument of your peace. Let the love of God show. And then something, I remember something else happened. We had, there were, and some of you heard me tell these stories before, but it was always new people, new people here, new people watching. You know, uh, we, I remember at a particular time there was uh, some people in our church and their children kept running away. The children were running away. And so we would counsel with the parents, counsel with the kids. One time we would, they would, had us praying. We don't know where they are, kids, the teenagers. They're gone two and three days. And we would talk to the parents. And then we finally talked to the kids. And the kids would say, I'm running away because I don't want to be in that house. It's so much drama in that house. They were talking about the parents. It's so cantankerous in this house. There's no peace in this house. They would rather take that chance in the street. And my kids were young, and I said, God, I don't want to be that man, that guy who's running his kids away from his house because I'm out of control with my saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, past the right direction, mega church self. And I'm driving my kids away from my house because I don't demonstrate the love of God. It doesn't mean that your kids are going to be perfect. Kids are going to be kids. Teenagers are designed to squeeze your fruit. Yeah. Especially that patience one. You're going to have to tighten, and for all you young ones, and somebody say, I rebuke that. The devil's a liar. It's all right. Rebuke it. I pray enough. But for most of us, you have to tighten your seatbelt and ride it through. There's going to be some years of turbulence. But you can make it through. And it doesn't mean you can't still discipline your children. It, it got to the point where, my, where I would spank my kids and not be, not be mad, aggravated at all. They just have earned a whooping. I wasn't mad. And sometimes they would look at me and say, I said, but, but you know, you know, you got to get, you know, I got to do this, right? <laughs> not raising my voice. And I, I had this, I had, you remember I had those three um, uh, uh, paddles. I had these three, they, they were pracks. They were paddles. They were no, they really weren't paddles, honey, originally. I thought they were paddles. No, they weren't paddles. They, they were pracks. Got them out of like a, a, a flea market. They went on but a wall. Did they have wall. like a little handle to it? Like they didn't have a handle on it. Okay. No. Uh -huh. okay. Love, joy, and peace. <laughs> love, love, ah. joy, and peace. And so I would use the love one. It'd go and I would, tell, I would tell my boys, lay down on the bed. Come on, I, I said, now, now, don't be jumping. I, I, we ain't going to do this. We ain't running around the room and chasing uh, you. Come over here. Get him, get back around. We wasn't doing all that. We wasn't having no drama. You deserve this. You've earned it. And I'm going to give you. A little love. I'm going to give you some love. And, and then, I used the paddle. And then love. I said, later, I, no more. I'm not trying to hit your hands. Just right on your behind. Then love went missing. Okay. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I don't know where, where the love went. <laughs> he went I'm missing. A, but to this day, they won't say. And then you grabbed another one. You see, you okay. would get faith. I started using joy. Joy. Like faith. But they all they <laughs> Did all that went missing? <laughs> okay. Those kids and, were but, a trip. But it got to the point, y'all, that I wasn't emotionally tied to it. I, I, I was disciplining my children in love, okay? But I didn't have all this emotion with it. Okay? I mean, to, the, to this day, y'all, sometimes sometime I think I went overboard because I don't, I don't get mad like that. I don't, some, I'm like, I ought to be, I ought to feel more, you know. I, I, you know and, some, and then I remember one time I just, Chandler had did something. I just, I, he just needed to see me mad. I acted like I was mad. I, and I started doing WWF on him. He, it was so funny. I took my start, th start throwing him from one side of the room to the other. You know, the way they like throw you to the turnbuckle. He said, Dad, Dad. I don't want the bus out left. I said, I done, I done told you. Whoa. <laughs> you do the room. He said that. Okay, but I, I took all the emotion, all that anger, and all that, all that. I, I asked God to take that away from me, 
and you can discipline your children without having all that. Amen. Amen. So he said, you were taught by God. 1 Corinthians, 1 John 3.14. Oh, man, my time's up. Okay. 1 John 3.14. We know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brother. And that's 1 John 3.14. The evidence that we're really saved is love. Not speaking in tongues. Thank God for your tithes and offering, but not even your tithes. Thank God for your hands lifted up in worship and dance and run around the church. But that's not the evidence that we are really saved and pass from death to life. The evidence that we're saved is that we love the brethren. He does not, he who does not love his brother abides in death. He said, I'm looking at the fruit. If there's no love, you still, you're not saved. That's why I said that statement in the beginning. And I say, we can go back to the scripture. John says, if you do not love, which means there's no love that's seen in you and emanates from you, you're still abiding in death. And so the more the fruit of the Spirit grows and develops in us, the more we should take on the personality of Jesus. And we should want to be like Jesus to the extent, and we're going to end right here. We, want, we should want to be like Jesus to the extent of the account in Luke, 9, in Luke 19, 2 through 10. Luke 19, 2 through 10, we read the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus didn't know Jesus. He had heard about Jesus, and Jesus was going to be passing by him and his entourage, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which means he was ostracized. They ostracized the tax collector. That was the equivalent of a drug dealer today, or even worse, because they, they sided with the Roman government to oppress the Jewish people by lying and taking taxes from them and stealing from them. You didn't know how much you really owed, and they lived off all they could get from you. And so Zacchaeus sees Jesus going by, and he climbs into a tree because he's short, and he wants to see Jesus, and Jesus walks by, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I must eat at your house. Zacchaeus is first just amazed that Jesus even would recognize him. There's probably other people recognize him too, but nobody would talk to Zacchaeus. Why would you talk? Why would you even talk to him? Jesus sees him, talks to him, says, I want to eat at your house. And the next thing we see was while Jesus is sitting there eating, the kids just jumps up and says, half my goods I give to the poor. And if I stole anything from him, I'm going to restore it to him ten times or four times. Jesus didn't condemn Zacchaeus. All Jesus did was demonstrate love to Zacchaeus. And watch this. He didn't condemn him. He wasn't mean to him. And yet that love convicted Zacchaeus. We should want to be the kind of Christians who sinners are not afraid to be around us. But yet they can still get convicted through us just by us demonstrating the love of God. I saw, some of you heard me say this before. Mahatma Gandhi, the one who, uh, who Dr. King studied, in terms of using nonviolence for social change. Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi uh, used nonviolent social change as a, as a political um, movement for India to get its independence from Britain. And Mahatma Gandhi, who demonstrated nonviolence as a political strategy for them to get their freedom, is recorded as having said this. If I ever really met a Christian and saw one, I would become one. If I ever really saw a Christian, I would become one. And this is somebody who demonstrated nonviolence long before Dr. King. He said, if I ever saw somebody who really demonstrated nonviolence, I would become a Christian. Let me go back to my question I asked this week, and I think I asked it last week. Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian in terms of your love walk? So in criminal court, we've got two types of courts. We've been seeing, you know, we see sometimes we've been seeing that in the George Floyd cases and all these Breonna Taylor cases. Is that you got the criminal court where they got to be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt by unanimous jury, convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard for a criminal court. But in civil court, where they're suing you for negligence, the evidence has to be by what they call preponderance of the evidence. Criminal court, beyond a reasonable doubt. Criminal court, I mean, um, civil court, preponderance of the evidence, which means it just tilts, if there was a scale, it just tilts a little bit more towards one side than the other. It tilts a little bit more to you are than you aren't, that you did more than you didn't. That's the standard in civil court. I'm not even asking, do you have enough evidence to convict you as a Christian based upon civil court standard? 
I'm asked, is there enough evidence to, to charge you based upon civil court standard? By how, by how you love, is it more likely you're a Christian than you're not? Or would people be shocked? Those here in the room and those watching, would people be shocked? And y'all know, y'all know there are people who when we hear that they're Christians, we say, what? Get out of here. Yo, he's a deacon. A de he, he on a deacon board. Maybe he on a demon board. Ain't no way he on the deacon board. You know, so-and-so. Say, say from what? We all know or those kind of people when we hear because there's just not enough evidence for folks to really believe that they're Christians. And I want us to live our lives and, and be deliberate and intentional to demonstrate the love of God in a way that says, I'm going to be convicted of being a Christian. Somebody going to wonder or think that I'm a Christian, which means we got to be careful how we respond, how, whether they cut us off, whether they stepped on your bunion. I don't even know what a bunion looked like, but I don't even want to see one. <laughs> whether they stepped on your bunion, whether they, whether they cross your, cut you off. Y'all know there, there's some people, boy, you, you, you know, you, you cut them off on the, on the road. The other, day, the other day, we were coming into a parking space, and I, Pastor Martha said, Mark, Pastor Martha said, you know, that, that woman is going to go in that space. I said, well, I'm just going to sit here. And so I, I sat there, and, and a woman looked at me, and she said, like, I was going to, like, she looked like she was scared. It was, it was an older white lady. <laughs> Pastor Martha said, she looked at me like, I, I don't want no problem from this Negro. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I said, go on <laughs> into the space. Y'all know, you, you don't know how people are going to react over a parking space or whatever. We just got to be determined to walk in the love of God. Amen. Amen.